Good afternoon, Michael. How are you? Good, Jenny White. How are you? <laughs> Am I in trouble? You use Jenny White. I'm in real trouble now. That's better than uh, Jay White. That's what I usually call you. <laughs> or boss. <laughs> yeah, or boss. Just... Go in. I got to get all, I need to be all proper in today's uh, naming epidemic. Make sure I use the right names. All right. Well, we've got, um, we actually have a special podcast for you today, which is why we're here on a Friday afternoon recording this. Um, we have a, uh, public school teacher with us, uh, from Tulsa, Gabe Woolley, and I'm going to bring him on here and hi, Gabe. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? We're pretty good. good. So I ran into you and reached out to you because I saw something on the dreaded Facebook uh, about some library books. And we've been a um, long time ago. I started noticing, I mean, when I say long time ago, I'm talking like 30 years ago. Um, I started noticing um, literature for kids getting kind of edgy. And then um, even 15 years ago when my kids were small, I was really, really noticing it. So it's been kind of a big thing for us. Mm -hmm. And when I saw this thing about this book, I thought I really need to talk to Mr. Woolley and find out what's going on. So can you kind of give me a little background on what was going on? Yeah, for sure. Um, and it, do you want to bring up the slideshow? Sure. All right. So my name is Gabe Woolley. I'm a teacher in Tulsa. I actually work at a public charter school in Tulsa. I worked for Tulsa Public Schools last year. Um, I was in District 4, Elena Ashley's district. And then I also work with Rescue Clayton and Parent Family Rights Advocacy with media, podcasts, documentaries, and stuff like that. But the focus uh, today is on the education system and my experience as a teacher. This is my ninth year in the classroom, uh, eight of those years being in Oklahoma as a teacher's aide, uh, AmeriCorps member, and teacher totaling um, nine years. And so <clears throat> what we have just been continuously seeing is an issue that, you know, Ryan Walters brings up, um, school boards are bringing up, is content in the classroom. And I think in other states, we're seeing some things being built into the curriculum. But in Oklahoma, the way it seems to be infiltrating us is with the books that are coming into the library systems or on the bookshelves. Um, as well as uh, other um, partnerships that public schools or even charter schools are making with nonprofits that are then being the Trojan horse, bringing in some questionable content or practices being modeled for the students in our classrooms. And the issue with that is, therefore, the public schools aren't doing it themselves. Their partners that they're partnering with and putting into the classrooms are doing it for them. So it may appear that they're not breaking any sort of rule or regulation, the public school themselves, when their partners are doing it for them. So just speaking from my own personal experience, I, I go to the Tulsa Public School Board meetings. I'm pretty engaged at my own public charter school in Tulsa. Um, I did confiscate a book from a student. Uh, this book was is a series. There are three books. It's called Heartstopper. Um, and it's, it has, you know, concerning content. Um, it's another thing that we're seeing very common and very popular in the classroom is graphic novels, which is a comic book form of a book where everything is pictures and there is just the comic book style, graphic novels, novel style. that's extremely popular with students. And so we have now seen an adaptation to more of these, um, books with adult content finding their ways as graphic novels, which is a way that you would typically present something to a child uh, to, into the classroom with um, uh, gender queer ideology, LGBTQ ideology, Black Lives Matter ideology, th things that can be divisive by race or sex or gender and things that we really want to see parents taking control of and choosing if they want to have their families participate in rather than our publicly funded schools, charter schools in public, publicly funded, bringing them in without any acceptance or awareness brought to the parents and really taxpayers 
especially in Oklahoma, the, a, a good number of us or majority, I would even argue, I believe the majority don't want to see this in the classroom because it's not the education system's place to be exposing children to this. And my opinion is it's not any adult's place to be exposing children to sexually explicit content. And well, so, let me ask you, what class, what age group are you teaching? I teach fifth grade. And last year I taught fourth grade. Um, I've always been elementary um, for the most part. I've done middle school some, but predominantly so this was, elementary. So this was a book for a fifth grade, for elementary, essentially, because yes. that's yeah. our middle school. So at our library, it, we, have kinder, we have kindergarten through eighth grade. They all share the same library. Um, as I've been in that library and observed other students outside of my grade checking out books or my own students, the librarian has not filtered any book for any age. They just, whatever they bring to her, they check out and they get it. Regardless of, there was no, oh, this this is above your reading level, very likely, or this is not appropriate for your age. Just whatever's in their hand, she types it up, gives it to them, and they move on. There, there was no threshold that I could find. And so this series, Heartstopper, had, um, I, I put some pictures of it on the screen. It, you know, it, if, it had a lot of um, aspects of intimacy, um, homosexuality, LGBTQIA type things on every single page. There was not a single page where someone wasn't kissing. And I, I was thinking, regardless of the gender ideology, regardless of the homosexuality or the straight aspect of it, where is the rigor and academic content yeah. in this book anyways? What is it yeah. teaching? What vocabulary necessary rigorous vocabulary is it exposing the students to what valuable life lesson is it bringing to the students and even if we put aside all the sexuality things there was not even the academic aspect to it and so that right there even if we took out the lgbtq stuff i would have challenged my students to find a different book um because i want them to be reading rigorous academic content that is teaching them some life applicable lesson, exposing them to rigorous vocabulary and content because we need to be holding a high standard for students for academic success. But this series, when I confiscated, I found it on my fifth grader's desk after we had already been through the library. I noticed the cover and I had picked it up as my students were transitioning and getting their backpacks and things. And I quickly flipped through it, put it on my desk. I just let my student know, hey, you've got two library books. Go ahead and take this one home. I'm going to hold on to this one. And so I immediately um, I informed my principal. Uh, my principal was very supportive of removing these books. He was not aware. And that kind of leads me into how did this these series even get into our school, our public charter school in Tulsa? Well, it turns out that Scholastic the publishing company that also does the book fair around the country for all schools, public charter and likely even private schools. When they have finished their sales at that school, they oftentimes give some books, a box of books as a donation, and they give them directly to the librarian. They do not go through the principals wow. or the administration, the front office. Uh, it is straight from Scholastic in our scenario and in other schools straight from scholastic to the librarian so there was no filter unless the librarian were to take it upon him or herself to have that filter or to hold that filter and then in this case at my school the librarian was in favor and put these books on the shelf herself and put them into our system without our principal's knowledge without teachers knowledge without students knowledge without parents knowledge and so when I took this book for questioning and my principal immediately responded in the right way. Um, he wanted us to go through all the books. He wanted us to go through their catalog. He wanted to find out if it was a series. It was a series. He confiscated all three of the series. The other two were also checked out by other students somewhere in the school at the time. And so I had to contact the parent because the child had already been exposed to the content. I already saw her reading it before I knew what the book was. So then I had to contact the parent. Hey, your child has already seen this. I don't know if you're okay with it or not. So I need to let you know. They were, um, they were very grateful that I had informed them. 
Um, and then the principal wanted me to go with him to get the books from the library and physically have her hand them over to make sure he had them tangible in his hands. And when that happened, the librarian held it up to her chest, crossed like this, and she said, why? What are you going to do with them? And he's like, it, I, I just need them. They're property of the school. They've been donated to our school. So I need I need, I need, need this as the property of the school. They're not yours. They belong to the school. And so she said, if you're going to throw them away or get rid of them, I just want to take them home. And so she put up a fight, didn't want to give up the books. My principal, again, insisted. He was very adamant about it. He was very against the books being in our school as well. And eventually she handed him that book. And then it took about another day or to track down the other two books and actually get them into his hands because they were already checked out by students. I also did report this to the state capitol um, because that there's been a system set up and um, some systems and other uh, areas and groups that are advocating for this. Good resources for parents and schools in Oklahoma is, of course, Moms for Liberty has their eyes open to this. They are involved in the schools, involved with parents, finding these books, letting parents know, checking the online systems, public schools and charter. But the system that I had reported this to with the state capitol, and anyone can do this, any citizen in Oklahoma, was this second link that you see here, or the second um check that you see here, Oklahoma Awarity Platform, report inappropriate issues in our schools. You can search Oklahoma State Department of Education slash Awarity, A-W-A-R-E-I-T-Y. And that is where you can report any questionable behaviors or questionable content in your classroom. So that was the uh, second step in the process that I had taken. So uh, administrator, Awarity Program, uh, it was already pretty late in the day, so I contacted the parents, you know, when it wasn't so late at night. Um, and then, of course, we have PragerU Kids, which is a good resource for students, and then Turning Point USA has found its way into Oklahoma. But the awarity system is how I reported it to the state capitol. Again, anybody can do that. And that's how that process for my school specifically in this situation that I was put into, how that process happens. And I think this is the process that teachers and educators, school workers and parents should be following as well when they come across content that is not appropriate uh, for children, especially. Um, and it, it was concerning to me, and I have many reasons why it was concerning to me when we're pushing this ideology or even the LGBTQIA ideology. I have my own experience formerly within that community and why it concerns me when I see children exposed to it and we are seeing a social contagion with it. I know that's a hot topic and a big point of argument is the social contagion aspect of it. Um, and I wouldn't be so adamant about that argument if I hadn't experienced it myself. And now I work full time as someone that advocates to protect children. And so my own experiences obviously play into that as that's the role that I've been brought into. I never planned to be a teacher. It was something I was called into. So I take, my oath in signing a contract with the school to educate children, yes, but to also protect children while they're in my care for eight hours a day, five days a week, uh, you know, eight, nine months a year. Well, I, I have a question for you, Gabe. Is, is there no, I guess, school policy that kind of dictates how donated material is handled or vetted from the school. I mean, what's stopping any parent? Okay, so so it, there was a partnership with Scholastic where these came in, but what's stopping a parent or some other organization from just donating whatever they want, you know, right in with, a you know, some type of, you know, system of, of not having any kind of accountability as to what that content is? In my experience, from what I heard when I followed up with our situation and what I've heard and seen from other schools, oftentimes if books are donated, they go straight to the librarian and the librarian is supposed to be that filter. Yeah. Um, it's supposed to be upholding the policy. I'm not aware of a policy at the charter school that I went to. My, po my Their policy appears to be aligning with the state capitals policy, which they did. And when they were made aware, they aware of it, they addressed it immediately. So I'm grateful for that. So they are mirroring Ryan Walter's expectations 
um, at this school that I'm at. That is not the case for a lot of public schools, especially in Tulsa public schools. Um, with Moms for Liberty, Janice Danforth, uh, we did very recently, a week ago, less than a week ago, actively find even more graphic than the book that I've expressed to you, um, pornographic, sexually explicit books in uh, two middle schools, but also public schools. So where this middleman is, and if they are actively participating in their role, it's supposed to be that filter, or if that's the policy with also public schools, I don't know. Yeah, but whoever is supposed to be the filter is clearly not doing the job. In well, you know, the, the American Library Association now has a, a chairman of the association who is a gay Marxist. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really certain anymore that librarians are friends of conservatives or even families right. that want to raise their children without having access to that kind of thing, right. you know, until they're old enough to be able to understand it. So, and, you know, it, it's a sad, it's kind of a sad day, really. And in, and I'm not going to say that all librarians, but oh, I, well, it, has, sure. it does seem to be a right. pattern I have seen with, with librarians in the schools that I've worked in. I did work for Tulsa Public Schools when I did their summer school program. I was working, I did work with the librarian and the librarian did make the comment on my face, Tulsa Public Schools, elementary school. If we're going to be reading books and curriculum and to students with straight couples, well, then I'm going to be reading books with queer couples because that only makes sense. That was a direct conversation we had sitting one foot away from each other. Um, that was a Tulsa Public School employee, found this person on TikTok, weird personalities on TikTok, lots of children following her TikTok. Um, oh, no. And so it's there that just to my point, um, yes, the library yeah. is an open avenue where we are finding these resources again, because Scholastic is giving the books straight to the library and it should be, yeah. going, should be going to terrible. an administrator or to the front office <laughs> until an administrator picks them up. Or in my case, my principal ended up um, making me the, um, our school's library on the library committee. So on the book committee for our school. So then oh, I, I, I will be actively looking into that as he's given me that opportunity to do that. But there needs to be some sort of accountability for that, for any tax funded school, uh, especially. Um, it, and it, it is a growing issue. And I think in conservative Oklahoma that we just think maybe it's not that bad. And I think that just maybe there's there's partnerships with not so conservative organizations that are being the Trojan horses for this and are being secretive about it. Luckily, <laughs> in a way, I have worked for half of these organizations in my past. And so I have sort of, though I had a good personal experience with my students directly between me and my students through those organizations, I was exposed to a lot of the questionable, questionable behaviors and worrisome practices that these organizations brought with it. So then since then, taking a step back, even in my alumni status from these organizations and I'm now actively working to expose the reality of it to the state capitol and to other Tulsa public schools and other aspects like that out of concern for the students and families and just yeah. trying to get education back to the way it should be with rigorous content. I mean, we are failing at reading and math. So why are, why are we trying to implement more aspects and more confusing topics yeah. that are made for adults into when we can't even get our students to read. It's just right. another distraction and another opportunity to put more work on the teachers itself too, when they are expecting you to do these things or putting them in. I mean, Tulsa Public Schools, when I was training with them, they very much had it embedded in their professional development for teachers. Okay. Wow. Well, I mean, well, that's this... just confirming what, you know, we've always, we've always said since Common Core was that that's part of the reason for teacher development is to spread some of this, you know, more, um, um, T family unfriendly right. content and what it really is now that i've worked for americorps tulsa public schools what it really is is there there appears to be an active recruiting strategy that would recruit a diverse group of people that would embody this mentality mm -hmm. and then putting them into the tulsa teacher core group or into the city year or teach for america group and allowing what would net what will naturally happen 
when you put like-minded people together, it will fester into becoming a different type of system from the inside out. So rather than, we're not, we're not requiring you to implement critical race theory. We're not requiring you and using the terms to implement LGBTQ stuff. We are actively hiring people who have that as a priority and letting them loose and it will naturally grow itself into that. And so wow. it's kind of it's kind of like well it's nowhere in the paperwork so you can't get us for it. Yeah. Well, ju just to clarify, Gabe, in, in your scenario with your school with the books that you found, th this particular book that you had on the screen, th this this came in through the Scholastic program after a book fair that they just left books, you know, in a box or or whatever, you right. know, with this librarian or were, you know, were there other teachers involved in that? I mean, there, there was just no vetting other than, than they just gave the books and that's right. just, that's just what how I, they came in. What I was told when I had the conversation, a long conversation with my principal in his office was he was trying to figure out how they had gotten into the school. And he says, well, they have not basically was saying they have not come across my desk, but the librarian had mentioned that they were donated by Scholastic. Yeah. And so, yes, they were given directly from Scholastic to the librarian. Wow. Directly put onto the shelf. Yeah. Well, so, and you know, well, you know, Jenny, when, when Molly did the reading room, Molly's X-rated reading room, which we have on the on our website, you know, there were hundreds. And, and, and she did Edmund, you know, kind of specifically. There were hundreds and hundreds of those books that were, you know, kind of anonymously donated or however right. they came into the school, yeah. but they're in the libraries, yeah. you know, now, and people have no idea. And, and I think what- Well, Gabe I need to release doing, the list because, you know, um, we had at least one legislator who said, um, well, I want to know where these books are. I haven't seen these books. And I need to go through and publish the list that Molly and I did together because we did all of Oklahoma County. So every yeah, school yeah, in Oklahoma huge. County, yeah. we looked at their library mm -hmm. and to set, there was only one middle school in all of Oklahoma County that did not have this stuff in it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what I, what people really need to have on their radar. And again, speaking from experience, having been through these systems and with these organizations, um, a lot of this is, trickling down from the universities in Oklahoma. Oh, sure. If you're yeah. in conservative and find a liberal hotspot, it's a university. Yeah. It's a breeding ground. And these uh, yeah. these nonprofits, organizations right now in Oklahoma are reading partners, Teach for America and City Year. These are AmeriCorps, the National Service Program, A-M-E-R-I-C-O-R-P-S. Right. Is, so all is, of these are AmeriCorps programs? They, they are. And this is federally Reading funded. Partners is even AmeriCorps. Yes, it is. I almost wow, worked Wow. <laughs> interesting. Uh, yeah, so I, what I, is City Year? Because I've heard of Reading Partners and I've heard for Teach for Amer heard of Teach for America. What is City Year? City Year is an education-based nonprofit organization that partners with public schools and charter schools um, in the systems and in inner city schools to address the dropout crisis. They work with students on their, their okay. ABCs, academics, behavior, and curriculum. And so they are given, core members come in between the ages of 17 and 25, as long as they've graduated high school. Most of them do it after college, straight from the university, or take a gap year. And they come in and they are partnered with a teacher, with a classroom of students, and they are given a focus list of, typically, mine, mine was when I worked for City Year, five math students, five ELA, and five behavior students, and five attendance students to work with them to get them. They were just at the threshold of needing a little push to be successful academics, behavior, or attendance. So we didn't get the low, low, low kids. It was the pushovers that were almost on the edge. We are given a focused list of students. We can push into the classroom and work with the teacher or do a small group. We can pull out and work one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, when I was in the program it was not monitored it was core members directly with the students privately for the most um i mean you did need to be somewhere with an open because we weren't certified somewhere with an open door so not completely closed off unless there was a certified person in the room but no one was standing there observing your lesson or watching what you were doing it was just you and the student and so they have to complete seven uh 1400 hours of service between classroom and community 
uh, in the school year to graduate the program. I did two years of this program in Tulsa Public Schools at Sequoia Elementary, uh, fourth grade my first year, fifth grade my second year. And so um, Tulsa Public Schools, I forget the figure number, Elena Ashley knows the figure number, but it is hundreds of thousands of dollars that Tulsa Public Schools is paying to have city year in their district. Uh, Tulsa Public Schools is the only district in the wait, state of Oklahoma wait. that has city year in them. Wait, so, but you said it was a nonprofit. Yes. So it's like OSSBA, Michael, right? It's like the Oklahoma State School Boards Association. <laughs> so it's a nonprofit that makes millions of dollars. It's a, a very year. expensive nonprofit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and it's a national program. Uh, city year is in. I want to say between 30 and 40 major cities around the United States. Well, if it's an AmeriCorps program, then it, it will be because, you know, again, you and I were talking before we uh, went on to record today and we were talking about the fact that um, really uh, we have President Obama to thank for AmeriCorps in schools because he was the one, if you go back and study at the very beginning of his administration. He started pumping AmeriCorps into schools and right. we were just, we've written all kinds of things about AmeriCorps. We had all kinds of concerns about AmeriCorps. And it's mm -hmm. so interesting to listen to you talk about this because unfortunately, sadly, you're, you're pretty much saying a lot of the things that we had concerns about. So, I mean. Right. And Bill and Hillary Clinton. I mean, you can just Google pictures. Yeah. And these people come up and they're yeah. wearing the red the red city year jacket, like the famous jacket. Um, and so it, 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 the problem that I have with this, and I'm a small, I believe in small government, conservative values. I want rural government to be out of the education system completely. I want it to be an Oklahoma education system because we know more what our students need than the national level does because they are further removed from us and know less about us simply because of that. And I even believe in giving, you know, I believe in supporting your local school board and getting as local as possible, as close right. to the student as possible to actually know what they need, which right. means big, strong partnership with parents. And parents should have the largest voice in the classroom when it comes to a publicly funded school. It should be a partnership for the teacher and the parent working together. And so what I have taken an issue with now with AmeriCorps is that this is another way that the federal government has their hands oh, yeah. in the states and very deep down and a city year now has celebrated its 10th year anniversary with Tulsa public schools. I was part of the year, the first year where it was a full fledged course. So now it's been 10 years, uh -huh. but um, you know, and I still am friends with people who are still currently on staff at city year. I still hear the stories. It hasn't, it's become more open about the things that Oklahoma is against. You know, they wow. released City Year on its Instagram page, its public Instagram page during Pride Month, released um, all the LGBTQ books with sexually explicit content and all the pronouns and all the um, different identities that children are encouraged to take on. And the argument at Tulsa Public School Board meeting with Deborah Gist was that, well, this was not given from city year to the students. And I, and I was telling board members, I was like, okay, well, when I worked for city year, these were advertised on their Instagram and city year core members told students to follow the Instagram page. So who cares how they got it to the student? They, 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 if you say, here's this book and you hand it to them, or you say, follow this Instagram page. And then we're going to put these books up on and you're going to see them because yeah. maybe you're following the page. Who cares? You can do. You can get it to them any way you want. You still expose them to it. So when you told the school board about that, they weren't. Was it kind of a kind of a it, thing? Or Eliana Ashley had voiced her concerns about it and her questions about it from community members, as my representative and as other parents and community members expressed their interest too. Um, uh, you know, other board members either just didn't know enough about it or had only heard positive things about city year and didn't support her in her decision to question it. So we need more Tulsa public school board members that are going to have their eyes open and look at things more critically and look at things um, really from both sides, because it was really a one-sided argument coming from other people out of a place of 
it seemed ignorance, not will, not willing to hear the other side coming from citizens that they represent. These board members represent expressing their concerns. I mean, it, it passed so fast. City years renewed so quickly. It's an easy rubber stamp. Yes, move on. Well, you know, I think, and I'm hoping anyway, that getting this information out uh, to parents is going to make them aware. But not just that. I mean, let's look at the State Department of Education. You know, Ryan's trying to do something, you know, there. Having insight and knowledge into how this stuff is getting into the classroom, because just as you said, you know, before, it, it's a fairly deliberate process. And it's always been, you know, when we complain about stuff like that in the classroom, people say, well, there's a law against it. It's not happening. You know, like shut up and go away. Right. right. Um, so it's super interesting to hear you who have been involved in these programs talk about it doesn't have to be in a book. It's not in the curriculum. It's the way, in fact, that they right. hire people in. It is. And it's and, and the way on, they push out information to the kids. That's and what it's, it's, doing it's printed on their badges that they're required to work wear every day to work their pronouns or on their badges. I mean, it's in subtle okay. ways. It's just Nate. It's just very natural to these nonprofit organizations. It's part of what they are at this point. And it's just not questioned. Right because they're there to help students read and, the, and their objective is that they're there to help students with math but we don't see the ag underlying agendas that come with it or it's just well, and it's disturbing it. to know too and and oh. check me if i didn't hear you correctly but it's disturbing to know that these people who aren't certified teachers and don't don't please I'm not a huge certified teacher fan. I'm a homeschool mom, right? So, right. I mean, that's not that big of a deal. But what I'm saying is, is there are people who aren't teachers yet who are with kids in areas where nobody's watching them. And that right. that disturbs me. And that let me just... Let me just speak to that from personal experience because I was 19 when I got into this program and I knew nothing about education and very little about working with kids. I made plenty of mistakes that were probably going unchecked just out of ignorance. And so there that's not to attack anyone who did the program. That just means that just needs to right. be a stronger accountability and partnership just to make sure that these young people that are learning to become teachers understand the laws and the regulations and the requirements. City year and as far as I know, reading partners and teach for America, teach for America, probably they go through more of the district's professional development because they're hired on and contracted as a teacher for the district through okay. teach for America, but city year does their own professional development. They don't go through the district's professional development. When I was in city year, we met on Fridays at our city year office and they did their own professional development and then sent us into the classroom Monday through Thursday. So Tulsa Public Schools didn't have any say in what we were being taught to deliver to students. We collect our own data, make our own lesson plans. It's checked by our own staff members. The teacher doesn't didn't check them. An administration didn't check the lesson plans. The district didn't check the lesson plans. All control was given to AmeriCorps. Now, what was done behind the scenes or with administration, I can't speak to. But my lesson plans were never looked at by an administrator of the school or the teacher or anyone in Tulsa Public Schools. It was always just my city or boss, my city or team leader or impact manager. So yeah. essentially, these people could be talking to these kids about virtually anything. Right. I mean, yes, you are supposed to build relationships with them and that's part of the aspect of it. But yes, I mean, de definitely. I mean, when I did my pullout sessions and sat in the hallway or in a room with a student or in the city, your room, it was not monitored in any way. Um, and I'm not saying you need to micromanage people, but these were not right. certified. These were not certified employees of the district. Well, and let's let's even remove that from the certification thing, because, again, I'm not into that. But let's remove it from that and just say. If if the if city year, for example, didn't run anything thing through the administration at all and they were basically doing all of their own stuff. 
that just by itself should be a problem because the taxpayers are paying the administration to pay attention to what's going on with their kids. Right. So let's just even take the certification part out of it. Legitimately, then TPS had no idea what these people were teaching kids. If, and I think that's the crime. And I'm going to just speak to my own experience because I don't know how it's changed over the years since I worked for City. Sure. Group. But I can tell you that my manager never said, I'm going to hold on to this lesson plan and and I'll get it back to you at any point. They, they were always mine. Like I, uh, like we looked over them together, and I don't recall ever a situation where they took a copy of my lesson plan or anyone. So there was no way to give it to an administrator. There was I had them, you know. So I can say from my experience wow. that that when I was in city year that it was really just between me and other city year staff members. Um, if something alarming came up, they definitely would have done something. But it was very much when I was doing the programs. And it could have changed since then, but City Year was partnering with, but operating under its own set of rules. Aside, you know, we talked about FERPA and stuff like that, um, but which doesn't really matter in school anyway. So right, but I mean, well, and I and I think you know this this has just continued to escalate, you know, to these major problems we have now because you know we've had weak school boards all this time where you know the the board the board members. Right. They just go along with whatever the district says. And if the district's not even really paying attention to a nonprofit like that, there's completely no oversight whatsoever. Because I know, you know, any any regular, you know, very concerned, you know, very thoughtful, you know, uh, school board member, you know, it, if, if I was on that or someone like Elena, you know, you're going to have an issue, you know, right. pretty quickly with the the circumvention of power. And right. what's actually being done here. And I did go to the Tulsa Public School Board meeting this past Monday, and I did read off all the names of these nonprofits and AmeriCorps, and I did tell them my experiences. I did tell them about the books that were found, even if that's apart from these nonprofits, um, specifically the books. I know there are other aspects of the gender ideology that is coming in. I could guarantee you through City Year. I mean, I've already seen, I've seen the badges with the pronouns on it. I've seen other things firsthand. Um, and I did made the I made the board aware that I don't agree with this partnership. Having worked for Tulsa Public Schools, having worked for City Year, having worked with Teach for America and with alongside Reading Partners, I did warn them against this from someone who has experienced it firsthand on the inside and stayed connected with these organizations enough to understand what's still going on. And uh, so they're not ignorant to it. They don't get to they don't get to use that argument anymore because I was there giving them all the information that I needed. And then I'll be giving this speech or this information again at Alina Ashley's next District 4 Tulsa Public Schools Good. community meeting, which is on October 30th at 6, 6 p.m. at God's Shining Light Church in Tulsa. So um, there's not going to be, there's not really room to plead ignorance on anything. Yeah, well, well good for you, Gabe. And I, and I think, Honestly, you hit the nail on the head earlier in the conversation where, you know, you said you're you're looking for rigorous studies, right? Uh, rigorous material. I, I think any school district, and especially, I mean, if we pulled up the reading math proficiencies at Tulsa, it's probably, you know, they're probably 30 or 40 percent proficient. And that's probably giving them, you know, a pretty good pat on the back, even at that level. As a school board member, as an administrator. You know, there's probably I'm sure there's other teachers besides right. you that just don't agree with those nonprofit organization kind of being involved to that degree. But but at some point you'd have to say, hey, the rigor is not here. What right. is the problem? And you should be able to start pinpointing these right. things pretty strictly quickly. academics yeah. stance. And I, my experience and I've been blessed to have a variety of experience in education. I have worked for one of the most successful charter schools in the state of Oklahoma and in the city of Tulsa. And then I have worked for some of the lowest performing public schools in the city of Tulsa. And Tulsa Honor Academy is a Tulsa public school charter school, and they are graduating all of their students and sending them on to the university of their choice with scholarships. Wow. And so I'm just, I just emailed my board member, Elena Ashley today and Ryan Walters. And I said, how is Tulsa public schools failing these students when you give accreditation to a Tulsa public school charter school that is doing producing the exact opposite right. results of you? Why are you not embodying what Tulsa Honor Academy is doing? Yeah. Your partner, why aren't you taking their practices and putting them in your public school or some or just some of them? 
Yeah. It's the data is right here. It's working. I've worked for Tulsa Honor Academy. It worked. I promise you it worked. There was a significant difference. Um, and so I just begged the question today in my email. I was like, you really want to see change? Follow the model schools that are right. not just talking the talk. They have now graduated their first class. And I believe it was like 94 or 96% of them went on to university. Well, wow. good for them. Well, Gabe, we're going to have to close it down here in a second because we're already at 40 minutes. But I do yeah. want you to, there are a couple other things that I know that you wanted to talk about. For sure. And certainly one of them for me is the fact that you've talked, you're trying to create an organ or you already have created an organization that I think, would you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think this is huge. Right. Absolutely. The first thing, the last thing is I'll tell people to check out this article by OCPA with Bree Overdick. It's great on teachers unions. And then this is a good option. Professional Oklahoma's educators, a uh, different option instead of the teachers unions we're seeing that are bringing down our education system. But to your point, ACT Oklahoma is something that's still in the works. We're just in the networking process right now. We're trying to reach teachers and reach community members. Uh, Senator Dana Prieto in Oklahoma approached me along with Elena Ashley, Tulsa Public School Board member, and they asked me to help them start ACT Oklahoma. That's the Association of Christian Teachers. This is not a teacher's union. Uh, this is simply a group of educators who have faith meeting together of work hours outside of the school property, outside of the classroom on their own time, um, just with adults um, to come together, share best practices, uh, pray for the success of our state and our nation and our students and their families, pray for the protection of them, um, come together, uh, share ideas for um, successful lesson plans, talk about rigor in education. Um, not, it's not an active uh, movement to bring any type of religion to the classroom. This is just like-minded teachers and individuals coming together and supporting themselves outside of the classroom. And so um, ACTS Oklahoma, the Association of Christian Teachers, we're in the networking process right now. So if you know any teachers or educators or community members that when we get these me monthly meetings rolling would like to come see a guest speaker, hear from teachers, strategize with teachers, help us produce an article, help us release episodes of a podcast we may be doing. We'd love oh, nice. them to reach out. And I'm very big on giving power back to the people and very big on transparency. If we are going to represent any aspect of education, you have a right to know as a citizen in the state of Oklahoma. And so that's why I was like, well, Dana told me I'd like to produce an article. And I said, absolutely. We can't, we're not going to do anything internally that we're not going to reflect and put out publicly for citizens to know because it's their right to know. And so yeah. we want to, we, I want to do a podcast if we get to that point, but we'll, we'll be looking to produce some articles about different aspects of what it's like to be a Christian in a public school system as a teacher and your faith, hopefully being the busy, biggest part of you and what motivates you and being the core of everything. But how do we operate in the public school system with certain regulations and still stay true to our values in a system that is actively just as it exists as a system working against us without anyone even intentionally doing it. It's just how the sure. system is when you have right. chosen to, when you have chosen to tear down a system and build up a godless replica of it, it is the natural consequence you pay. And so um, what is it like to work as a Christian in the secular world like this? And how can we care for students and their families and just be good educators in general? So they can, as of right now, they can find acts, Association of Christian Teachers Oklahoma on social media. We have a Facebook page, an Instagram page, and a Twitter page, or X is the new Twitter. So they can just search Association of they Christian say, Teachers. They say X, formerly called Twitter. X, formerly called Twitter. We're in the works with a website for X Oklahoma, but right now Facebook is probably the best recommendation I have for you. Again, I want to let people know we are in the networking process, so we are not having any meetings yet. We're not producing any content yet. We are going to go throughout the city of Tulsa. Any teachers are welcome to join private school teachers, charter school teachers, public school teachers. And when we have public meetings, any citizens are welcome. And so um, 
just network, spread the word, share this logo on your Facebook, find my Facebook page, Gabe Woolley, W-O-O-L-L-E-Y. Um, I get lots of hate on there and I get lots of love on there. I leave it public anyways, because I do too much public work to keep it private. So um, find the app's Facebook page, share this logo, say, hey, any teachers out there interested in this? Really what we need with people's help with this is networking. Please spread this logo around, spread the word. And actively in your Facebook post, say, please share this. Please look into this page because we need to reach throughout the whole state of Oklahoma. However, we are starting in Tulsa County and focusing on that. Yeah. Uh, well, I hope because I've got some friends in Oklahoma City that might even be interested. You and know, we at still want to following you. So, we yeah, we still want them to follow because we'd right. love to branch out there or if they'd like to. If we meet during a time when we're not in session for school, please come to Tulsa and Maybe we'll find someone from Oklahoma City that wants to start the Oklahoma City branch. Please don't yeah. be restricted to where you're at in the state to connect with us. Well, you know, both of us, both Michael and I are ex ex super excited about that. And and Michael, you know, you have this story that you've told before, but it's worth probably telling again about, you know, the teacher and the Snapchat. Yeah, I was just on mute there because I had a little background noise, but but I, I've seen, I've been contacted by parents who have, uh, I'm not going to give the name of the school yet or, or what grade even, but it's, we'll just say it's, it's very inappropriate for school employees to be Snapchatting with students. They, they, there's an employee in the Edmond public schools that takes young boys into classroom um, has lunch just with these boys, has a relationship with these boys, is Snapchatting, you know, off hours and, and all of the time, you know, and it's, and hopefully we can blow with that. With students? Yeah, hopefully. We oh, that's that. not even, that's not even allowed. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, you, well, there used to be an understanding once you left your nine to five work hours, your students can email your work email at the most to ask for help on homework. And that's about it. There's no communication outside of the classroom. You can contact the parent. But well, I think, I think part of the reason why I brought it up too is, you know, the person who wants to out this is, does not want to bring this out because yeah. they're scared of what will happen. And honestly, Gabe, I think if you have, an organization like this where parents can feel, I mean, where teachers can feel like they're not, I mean, there are other teachers right. because we were just talking to Janelle Shellam today, who's a parent and admin who's been reading all of these books and putting that out. And, you know, we talked about it. And I made the point that really oftentimes people just need a leader, you know, they'll right. think about it, but they're not going to do anything. But once they see one person do it, then they'll get behind that person. Right. And so I think that's exactly what you're creating with this organization is that kind of opportunity where, you know, you step out in leadership and then maybe that will help other teachers, right. you know, feel more secure in doing the right things in their school. Because, even when I was teaching and I wasn't even a Christian at the time that I was teaching, there was so much bullying among teachers. It wasn't even funny. Right. Yeah. yeah. And one thing that I'll say is if this person wants to contact me, I'll be the face of it. We don't need to mention their name. I'll take the, I'll take it on if we need to, I'll put my name on it. And so um, one thing that I'll say to people lastly is that the Rescue Clayton podcast covers education. So if you want to know more about what's going on in ag education in Oklahoma, our last two episodes are very heavy on education. So check out the Rescue Clayton podcast and we sit down with Moms for Liberty, Elena Ashley from Tulsa Public Schools, parents from the district. We talk about issues we had with the Union Public Schools on this podcast. So um, reach out to me personally, visit the Rescue Clayton podcast. And if you want to have that um, individual who knows about the Snapchat issue, contact me. That's perfectly yeah. fine. But just know that there are resources for parents and community members and teachers that um, need to band together and network. So uh, rescueclayton.com, find the podcast, just look or just look me up on social media. Totally fine. I've accepted that as my life now. So. <laughs> Well, Gabe, thank you so much for being with us today. And you totally, I mean, I've been doing this a long time, but, you know, research only gets so far and you really have to know somebody who's 
it's kind of research can tend to be out here and you really need to find somebody who's in here, yeah. you know, yeah. inside the bubble. You're First just experience. Well, exactly. That's, that's what I was going to say is Gabe is uniquely qualified and has yeah. credibility because mm -hmm. he has not, not only has he just been a teacher and, and, and ex seen this and he's come forward, you know, he's worked within these other organizations and, and seen, you know, from the inside, you know, the inside from that angle also. For sure. And when you look back and wonder why you've been through things and why you worked here and why you worked there, it starts to make more sense on the other end. But <laughs> I'm really grateful for the work you guys are doing. I'm super grateful to Elena Ashley, Ryan Walters, yeah. and everyone. I really feel like this is a collective effort throughout the whole state just to better education and just to bring rigor and quality back to education. And again, I really hope that Tulsa Public Schools takes on the challenge of following Tulsa Honor Academy. I really hope that parents keep showing up to board meetings. And I really hope that we keep producing content like these podcasts to be reaching, especially this next generation is a podcast yeah. generation. So mm -hmm. uh, it's very important to give an alternative to the secular content. I, mean, I think of my students and their future when I put stuff out like this too. So when yeah. it's age appropriate, when they're old enough and have access to this stuff, I hope they they can see a fruitful side of it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Gabe, for being with us. And thank you for being a strong, thank you for standing up. And um, we're so excited to, to do whatever we can to partner with you on the ACT. I think that's great. Yeah. And um, so happy to do. So just send us anything. Um anything and we'll, you know, help get that out. So, you know, please feel free to do that. And thank you again. And everybody, uh, we will see you again another time with another special podcast and please like, and share this and uh, really get Gabe's message out. Yeah. So thanks again for being with us.